Hi, I'm the History Guy. I have a degree in history. I love history. And if you love history too, this is the channel for you. There's an old saying that the sun never sets on the British Empire. And what that really means is, is that the empire was at least at one time so large, at its height, two-fifths of the world's landmass, that the sun didn't set on the empire. No matter what time it was in England, it was daytime somewhere in the empire. But that was a long time ago, right? I mean, the, the empire is pretty much gone now. There must be a time now, in 2017, when the sun does not shine on the British Empire. Well, actually, no, there isn't. See, Great Britain still has 13 overseas territories in addition to the United Kingdom, and there is never a time of day when all 13 of those territories are in darkness. And so the sun still does not, as it has not since the 1700s, set on the British Empire. But there is a weak link. You see, every night at about midnight Greenwich Mean Time, the sun goes down over the British Cayman Islands. And it won't be for about another hour, about 1 a.m. Greenwich Mean Time, that the sun will come up over the island of Diego Garcia and the British Indian Ocean territories. And so for one hour a day, the sun only shines on one tiny piece of the British Empire. Pitcairn Island, the least populous national jurisdiction in the world. And oh, does Pitcairn Island have a history. Pitcairn Island is a volcanic island, one of the southernmost of the Tuamotu Archipelago, which also includes French Polynesia. It at one time had a Polynesian population that lived there for at least several centuries, but abandoned the island sometime around the 15th century. It got its name in 1767 when it was sighted by the British sloop HMS Swallow, and it was named after 15-year-old midshipman Robert Pitcairn, who happened to be the first person to sight the island. But the island at that point was uninhabited. However, its future was about to change. In 1787, a ship left Britain bound for Tahiti. Its mission was to collect several breadfruit plants and to move those to the West Indies, where it was thought that they would be a cheap source of food. The ship had three full masts and full rigging, even though it was rather small. Its name, HMS Bounty, captained by one William Bly. And as you may have heard, in April of 1789, there was a mutiny aboard HMS Bounty, led by master's mate Fletcher Christian. The mutineers put Captain Bly and the loyal members of the ship adrift in a boat, and several of the mutineers asked to be led off in Tahiti, and so it was that only eight of the Bounty mutineers and 18 native Tahitians, 11 of them women, set sail with Fletcher Christian aboard the Bounty in search of a home that would be safe from British retribution. It took some months for the Bounty to find Pitcairn Island. It seems that when HMS Swallow had identified the island in 1867, they had been off on their calculations, and the island was actually some 180 nautical miles from where they thought it was. But that was an advantage, thought Christian, because that made it just that much less likely that the British would find them. When they arrived, they burned and sunk the bounty so that it wouldn't give them away. Its wreck is still visible underwater in Bounty Bay. The island was a good choice. It had an ample supply of fresh water, had plenty of food, and lots of arable land. And so the small group settled down and set about the business of creating the next generation of Pitcairn Islanders. But life on the island was far from idyllic. It was actually a subsistence existence, and a combination of drunkenness and jealousy led to a series of murders that took the lives of five of the mutineers, including Fletcher Christian, and all of the Tahitian men who had come aboard the bounty. Of the four mutineers that were left, one more died of drunkenness, and another one was killed in self-defense but the remaining two were able to re-establish order, and they did so through the scriptures, using the Bible that had come aboard the bounty. They used the Bible to teach Christianity and literacy to the nine remaining women and 19 children. One of the mutineers eventually died of an asthma attack, so that when finally a ship arrived to visit them, the American ship Topaz in 1808, only one of the original mutineers was still alive. His name was John Adams. And when the British Admiralty heard about it and came to 
pay a visit, they found that Adams was the leader of a thriving community, and so they forgave him his role on the mutiny aboard the HMS Bounty, and they held up Pitcairn Island as a symbol of Victorian virtue. Adams died in 1829, and the only settlement on Pitcairn Island is still called Adamstown. Pitcairn Island became an official British colony in 1838, and then in that year established their first constitution, which guaranteed the right to vote for all Pitcairn Islanders over the age of 18, and thus it became the first British constitution to guarantee women's suffrage. Still today, it is the smallest population of any democracy in the world. By the 1850s, the population had grown to around 200 and was exceeding the resources of the island. They appealed to the British government for help, and Britain offered them Norfolk Island, which is in between New Zealand and Australia, and the entire population of Pitcairn Island was packed off to Norfolk. But a number of the Pitcairn Islanders decided that they wanted to go back, and eventually another group followed them as well, and so life continued on Pitcairn Island. In 2004, the island was rocked when seven men, fully one-third of the adult men on the island, were charged by the British government with 33 counts of sexual abuse of children, some of them going back decades. Apparently the abuse was the result of a long-term culture, partly maybe because of legal ambivalence. Some derived from Tahitian culture, and some of it may be the survival culture, which had been there since the island was first settled, which said that you had to populate the island. But the charges bitterly divided the island, and many islanders chose to leave. In the end, the men that were convicted had to be incarcerated on the island. They built a jail for them because their services were still needed, especially to operate the longboats, which is the only way that the island has to get goods from ships to the island. Life on Pitcairn is not easy. The island has no air service. The few supply ships are often chased away by weather, and it is difficult to get supply from off the island. Much of the food supply is still provided by subsistence agriculture, and everybody has to pitch in to keep the island's small infrastructure running. The islanders do sell stamps and coins and souvenirs, but for the most part, the operating costs of the island are subsidized by the British government. The island has electricity for several hours a day that's provided by diesel generators, and during that period they do have access to the internet, although the bandwidth is limited. But the only person who is qualified to operate the electrical grid is now 67 years old. The island produces honey and has one of the world's best population of disease-free bees. Their honey is said to be a favorite of Queen Elizabeth and Prince Charles. 80% of the island's revenue comes from tourism, despite its remoteness and the difficulty in accessing the island, and the fact that because of the abuse trials, any child below the age of 16 requires an entry clearance application to even visit the island. The island survives on the edge. It only has a population of around 50. Young people tend to emigrate away because of the remoteness and the lack of opportunity. As of 2014, the island only had a workforce of 31, and just seven of those were below the age of 40. Attempts to attract back former islanders and new settlers have so far been unsuccessful. And so for one hour a day, the sun shines on just one tiny remnant of the British Empire. And in that sun, we see the juxtaposition between the past and the future, between wilderness and civilization, between paradise found and paradise lost. And the rich history alone is enough reason for us to appreciate the world's smallest national jurisdiction. I'm the History Guy. I hope you enjoyed this edition of my series, Five Minutes of History, short snippets of forgotten history, five to ten minutes long. If you did enjoy it, then please click that thumbs up button that's there on your left. And if you have any questions or comments, feel free to write them in the comment section. I will be happy to respond. And if you'd like five minutes more of Forgotten History, all you need to do is click the subscribe button that's there on your right.